Please turn to uh, Mark chapter 7 with me. Mark chapter 7, it's on page 843. Page 843 in those black Bibles under the chairs in front of you. 843. So as we uh, continued in Mark chapter 7 last week, we saw that a conflict with the Jewish leaders led to Jesus teaching people that it's, it's not the people that are unclean before God because of food they eat or, or because of their ethnicity, but because of what's in their heart. That's what makes a person defiled or unclean or unacceptable to God. So uh, the, the teaching there was that the true condition of a person's heart is expressed through their thoughts and their words and their actions. So it's not religious ritual that can make us right with God. So this morning... We we'll walk through two episodes where these desperate Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish people, that, that, the, that the Jewish leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, would have considered to be unclean dogs before God. Well, they approach Jesus for help. They plead with him, and he meets them in their need. So even as Jesus claimed to be God's promised deliverer of the Jews, he was rejected by them. So fortunately for all of us, since as far as I know, none of us are ethnic Jews, today's verses show that the Lord Jesus delights to respond to all who seek him in faith, regardless of background. So would you pray with me, please, as we open God's word together. Father, your word is precious. Thank you that your word, empowered by your spirit, does your work. And so, God, I ask you to do that now. I've, I've prayed, I've prepared, I've studied, I've, I've done these things, and yet, God, this won't mean anything unless you work in us as I read your word. And so, God, uh, with a trembling reverence, I ask that as I read your word, these most important words that will come out of my mouth this morning, that you would use your word to do your work. God, as I, as I preach them, would you be merciful to me in granting me a humility that would exceed any ability you've given, and, and growing in me the character that reflects the character of Christ that would exceed any influence you give me just because I have a microphone. I do your work here. Thank you for this precious privilege. Uh, you give me to participate in your work this way. So God, this is my offering this morning. God, be, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24 where the Lord Jesus leaves Galilee. It says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were open and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus and his 12 disciples have been ministering in this Jewish region called Galilee for several months now. So in today's verses, begin this account of them ministering throughout a couple of Gentile areas, up in Tyre and Sidon, and then down in the area of the Decapolis. So the Bible uses the word Gentile just to mean anyone who is not an ethnic Jew. So today's verses represent this point of transition in Mark for a season, where he begins to, uh, um, he, he's, uh, I'm sorry, he's beginning to, to minister among the Gentiles. So 
So that being said, since it's a time of transition, we'll look back and just kind of get a, a, a foundation here to see that he was rejected by his own people, the Jews. But then he heads into this Gentile city called Tyre. We'll see more evidence of Jesus' authority over the spiritual world. And then as he heads to the Decapolis, uh, his uh, power over the, the physical world. So both episodes with these Gentiles present this idea that Jesus delights to respond to all who seek him in faith, regardless of ethnicity. And I get that word delights from Matthew 15. Matthew's account, he, he responds to the woman, I'll explain later, that she has great faith. So you, can, you can tell this, this, this gratefulness, this joy in Jesus at her demonstrated faith. So, first of all, we've seen a clear pattern that Jesus has been rejected repeatedly by his own people. Several chapters in Mark include these accounts of the scribes and Pharisees, these Jewish religious leaders that are trying to trap Jesus in his words or even condemn him for his works, even good things that he does, even healing on a Sabbath, they try to condemn him. So we saw in chapter 6 that Jesus' hometown crowd in Nazareth, people you know, he grew up around, they rejected him. Who is this guy? What's he doing? Well, first part of chapter 7 describes this uh, interaction with this, the uh, scribes and Pharisees confronting Jesus about his disciples not following their religious rituals, but then he ends up confronting them about the point of those rituals. And the, really, it's revealing their lack of reverence for God. So then, of course, they reject him because they don't want to deal with their own sin. So we saw how it's dangerous when religious rituals can replace a reverence for God. So then, just recapping the next section, in chapter 7, it's wrapping up this season of Jesus' public ministry in Galilee. It's emphasizing their continued rejection of him. So it, we see it was just marked by complete opposition, time after time, by the Jewish authorities. So then, Mark documents that as Jesus traveled through the cities and through the countryside of the Jewish region, this is Galilee, he often told people to not tell anyone about his healing, to not tell anyone about his teaching or anything he was doing. Because Jesus was intent on following the timeline that God the Father had for him. Okay? He likely knew that King Herod uh, thought he was John the Baptist raised from the dead. He said, oh, I beheaded John the, John the Baptist. Maybe this is him raised from the dead. He's thinking, well, okay, Jesus knows that. Uh, Jesus knows that the scribes and Pharisees are out to get him. So he's saying, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. I want to be on the Father's timeline here. I know they're, they're plotting against me. My time will come, but my time is not now. Now, in the Gentile areas, though, uh, in some cases, he said, go and tell. Go and tell other people how much the Lord has done for you. And then today, he says to not tell anyone. So uh, it depends on the, the scene there. So, but generally, in the Gentile areas, he's letting people go and, and tell what the Lord has done. So it's not surprising, then, that as the setting of Jesus' ministry transitions toward these Gentile areas for a season, word about him spread rapidly. So today's first episode is Jesus going into this house in a city called Tyre, and uh, he was probably going to give his disciples some rest, certainly some further instruction, and then uh, he's interrupted. So just briefly, Tyre and Sidon are in the map. You see it way in the north. They're pagan areas. So just pagan simply means that they did not worship the one true God, but instead they worshiped all sorts of idols. So imagine this. Jesus, the Jew, and his disciples, the 12 Jewish followers, they're, they're walking with him into the city of Tyre, and it's a busy port city even today in Lebanon. They're walking in, they're walking past statues of false gods. They're hearing people cry out to these false gods of stone and wood and whatever. They're pleading with these objects of stone and wood to give them healing or rain or fertility or whatever. And Jesus is walking by as this is happening in the street. So this is what Jesus and his disciples would have encountered as they entered the city of Tyre. So a few things to note about this region, historically. If you heard the name Jezebel, she's a Jezebel. That Queen Jezebel was one of the queens uh, of, you say, the queen of Israel. Her husband, King Ahab, uh, was the king of Israel. And, and Jezebel was famous for inciting Baal worship. So worshiping this false god of the Canaanites. So she's from this area. And then Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that there was even a king in Tyre that at one point he claimed to be God. So the, the, the cities of Tyre and Sidon and the regions surrounding them have this solid history of being at odds with the people of God. However, 1 Kings chapter 17 in the Old Testament 
tells us that there's a Gentile widow in a place called Zarephath, which is near Sidon. God used her to provide for his prophet Elijah. And even in this godless area, she somehow responded in faith when Elijah asked her to give him the last bit of food that she had during this famine, and then God provided for both of them. And so that's the region of Tyre. So then Decapolis, I want to just cover the basics here so we know where we're headed. So the location referred to here is the region of the Decapolis. This is where Jesus healed the deaf guy. Decapolis just means 10 cities, Deca meaning 10. So the purple region on the map, on the right-hand side, this is also where Jesus healed the suffering man who was possessed by a legion of demons. You remember that at the end of chapter 4, Jesus calms the storm, and the disciples say, don't you care if we drown? He sends waves, be still, water, be quiet. And then they come across the shore, and they land there, and they're greeted by Mr. Welcome Wagon himself, this big burly dude, full of his own blood and mud, with shackles hanging off of him, possessed by a legion of demons. So where that happened, that guy said, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you now. And he says, no, go back and tell everybody what I did for you. Tell, tell them what the Lord has done for you. So we have, um, this is his response. Jesus did not permit him to follow him, but said to him, go home, tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he, that is this man who was possessed by legions of demons, went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. So then, that man, that, that first Gentile missionary in this region, surely did this. Because the second of today's two episodes we'll walk through is evidence that the word spread far and wide because at the time, you'll, you'll recall, they were begging Jesus to leave them. Remember the 2,000 pigs ran down the hill? Jesus, get out of here. We don't want you here anymore. Well, now he's back, and here they are begging him to heal this man who was deaf. So word about Jesus and his goodness were spreading among uh, these Gentile regions. So even still, they're up in Tyre and Sidon. We'll go back to that map. They're up in Tyre and Sidon. And then they came back, not through Galilee, but they went the, kind of the long way around to the Decapolis because throughout Galilee, these Jewish regions, there's people who either, the scribes and Pharisees wanted to kill him, or the people were excited and wanted to make him king by force says in John 6. So, so he avoided those regions and went into the area of the Decapolis. So that we see, that's the background here. Jesus is rejected by the Jews that, to whom God promised the Messiah. And so for this season of ministry, he's heading into the Gentile area. All right. So that, so Jesus brought his disciples away. He bring them away from the crowds. He, he tries to go to this house for rest and teaching, but he couldn't remain hidden. So then here's this revelation again that he is Lord over the spiritual world as this woman says, my little daughter, she's at home, she's far away from here, she's possessed by a demon, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? She's pleading with him. So Mark tells us this woman's a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, so in a nutshell, she's a Greek-speaking pagan who probably was broke, spent everything she had, was probably exhausted just trying to get help, just like the woman with the issue of blood. She's just longing for some resolution. You think, well, what would it have been like for this little girl's daughter? How bad is that? How bad is demon possession? Well, Lord willing, in several weeks, we get to Mark chapter 9, where there's this vivid description of a boy possessed by a demon. And it's ugly. The, the demon throws this little boy down, makes him roll around on the ground, makes his body rigid, and he's foaming at the mouth. Okay, so this little girl has a daughter at home like that, and, and she's in this pagan area, Greek-speaking Gentile. She's like, maybe this Jesus can help me. I believe he can, so I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there to him. Just think of that little girl. Who knows what kind of emotional and physical scarring she had as a result of this demon possession. So this mother was at the end of a rope. She, it says she had heard of him, Maybe through the grapevine, this man who was healed of the demon possession earlier. And she went to him because she believed that he could help. She heard of him and made the effort to go to him because she believed he could help. So she came in this humble, persistent faith. There's two things I want to point out about her faith. First of all, falling at his feet. 
This is a humble expression of respect for him. The verb and the phrase, then she begged him, is in the imperfect tense, which means that there's an ongoing action. Matthew 15 says she kept begging him. So this woman is just saying, hey, would you mind healing my daughter? Oh, whatever, you got time, great. If not, she's begging, she's crying out. She's constantly begging, pleading with him to heal her daughter. So her faith was a humble faith. We'll see that more in a moment. And her faith was a persistent faith. Interestingly, using the same word for begging, Matthew's account tells us that when the disciples saw that lady doing this, the disciples begged him to send her away. They still hadn't caught on. They're still like the Jewish Pharisees we read about that are trying to send away the people who want to come to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 15, he says to the woman, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders of the house of Israel, the Jews, they considered anybody who wasn't one of them to be unclean and unfit to know God. We've seen that in the last several chapters. They would even call them dogs. Well, so reading of Jesus calling this woman a dog for us in modern 2023 thinking, especially in this country, we might think, Jesus, this is a horrible way to talk to somebody. What in the world, how in the world would you dare talk to someone like that? I thought Jesus was loving. Well, in context, it is. In context, he's actually opening up the door of the kingdom for her, this Gentile, when it had not been opened before. So the scribes and Pharisees use a word for dogs, the uh, Greek word is kuon. It's, a, it's this wild dog, this ravenous scavenger dog that, that would lick the sores of the homeless people. You read about that and Lazarus and such. That's, that's kuon, these dangerous, dirty dogs. That's what the self-righteous religious elite, all the Jews, called anybody who wasn't Jewish. Kuon is the word there. So the word that both Jesus and this woman used, that's also translated as dogs here in 27 28, it's a different word. It's related, but it's a different word. So the word is kunarion. So it specifically refers to a dog that would have been known and cared for in someone's home, like a pet. So, so Jesus actually is, he's using this term to clarify God's unique covenant with Israel, with the Jews, but he's also communicating to her that just because they're first priority means they're a second and you're part of that. So essentially he's saying, look, no parent would interrupt their meal with their kids whether they're feeding their kids to stop and feed their dogs. But then she has a response to that. So just camping on this idea of priority for a while because this is kind of a new thing for us here. So God's priority uh, for the Jews that he sent Jesus the Messiah to is found throughout God's word. Romans chapter 1 says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or, or Gentile. So clearly this woman was not offended by being called Kunarion. <laughs> she jumps right in on this metaphor, and she's like, hey, well, well, fine. But even then, the little dogs get to be in the house and eat the scraps from the children while they're eating. So the woman speaks with humble confidence that God's great mercy will extend beyond just the Jews. We see that all the way back to Exodus, where it says there was a mixed multitude that went out with the people of God. So this is a theme throughout Scripture that, that the Jews will be first, but then he'll graft in, he'll gather in more people to be his own. But again, think about the context here of the, the religious elite going, hey, th this idea that Jesus, who's taught in our synagogues, he's willing to spend time with this Kuon, this Gentile woman, that's scandalous. The, the scribes and Pharisees and synagogue rulers would have been shocked. They would have been horrified to think, how could he do this? How could he spend time with her? He might have even touched her. Well, it's interesting then to see that phrase, little daughter, in verse 25. You look at verse 25 there. Verse 25 in your text. Th this is a term of affection, this phrase, little daughter. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. And you know where it is? It's in Mark. And the irony is, it's used, it's found coming off the lips of a man named Jairus, of the religious elite, the synagogue ruler who says, Lord Jesus, my little daughter is sick. And then he dies. Jesus resurrects her. So, so here we have this contrast of social position. We have, we have this lady who's a Gentile, 
And we have this guy who's a religious elite, the Jewish Pharisee, or I'm sorry, the, he's probably a Pharisee, he's the ruler of the synagogue. So you have this massive contrast in their social position, and Jesus healed both of their daughters. It continues to drive home the point that Jesus delights to respond to all who seek him in faith, regardless of their background or their ethnicity or their social standing or anything else that, that the world might differentiate, differentiate among them. So the woman didn't gasp when, when, and accused Jesus of microaggression by calling her a kunarion. In fact, she responded in kind and used that same word. So she joined in with grateful humility, joined in the conversations. And her saying, hey, look, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That was that, hey, even, even the family pets get to eat the crumbs. So she, hey, I'm not messing with your time with the disciples. You keep doing what you're doing with them. Just, just throw me a crumb here. Well, the woman's humility and her persistence reveal the genuineness of her faith. The woman's humility and persistence reveal the genuineness of her faith. So her decision to take Jesus at his word revealed this simplicity of her faith. She's thinking, hey, you call me a house pet? Then I am. Fine. That's what I am. But that means I belong in the house. And that means I have a master. And that means the master is going to provide for me. And that means I'm known and I'm cared for in this house. So I'll take, I'll take what I can get. The precious uh, response of Jesus recorded in Matthew, he says to her then, great is your faith. The Greek word there is megas. We get mega, like mega, mega packs of whatever. Mega rolls of toilet paper. You see that word all the time, mega. Well, that's what this Greek word megas means, great. He says, great is your faith. So the Lord Jesus is pleased with her demonstrating this, this humble, persistent faith. She trusts him to heal her, her daughter. Her faith brought delight to him. So Jesus called this woman's faith a mega faith because of her humility, because of her persistence. If she had not approached Jesus humbly, let's, for example, if she, she acted like he owed her something, or if she had been not been persistent, just asked him once and just kind of gave up and said, ah, it won't work anyway, would have shown that her faith is not genuine. But she was humble and she was persistent in her faith. So the woman's approach to Jesus then pleased him. So what about us? I hold up a mirror here with this text. As you approach God in prayer, are your prayers marked by humility and persistence? Does God owe you something when you pray? Or are you seeking him and grateful you can even, that he would even hear you as father and you're in his house? Are there my price persistence? Or you just say, well, I asked him once or twice and I don't know, I'm just going to forget it. Remember that God is doing something in us while we pray. It's not always just about the giving and receiving of certain things. It's about the communion with God as we pray. So then do you ever think about God delighting in your prayers? You ever think about him delighting in your humility, delighting in your persistence and saying, look at this mega faith. Look at this mega faith. So the scripture says there are ways we can delight the heart of God by taking him at his word, believing what he has said about himself. So that's the Gentile lady with a demon-possessed daughter. The second episode of Jesus healing in Gentile territory takes place in the region of the Decapolis on the east side of the sea. So only Mark includes this, uh, this detailed uh, healing of this, of this man's uh, um, uh, going from being a deaf mute to being able to speak plainly. So the Lord Jesus again revealed his, revealed his authority over the physical world as he responded compassionately to this deaf man's faith. That's what he was responding to. The man came to him in faith. Jesus responded to his faith. So it says that he had a speech impediment. So we can assume from that that there, he could speak to some extent, but because he was deaf, he couldn't hear himself. So likely he had some accident or illness that brought on that deafness. He could no longer hear himself. And you can imagine if you can't hear yourself speaking, you ever sing with uh, earphones on? People are like, what are you doing singing? Because it doesn't sound so great. It sounds a lot better to ourselves, right? Well, he can't even hear himself. So he's over time that it's, it's degrading. He's making these unintelligible sounds. So so he had this speech impediment. So I learned this week as I, as I just try to read about what it would be like to be deaf in ancient times, that obviously this is way before a standardized sign language was invented. The social stigma attached to being deaf 
was actually much worse than, than the stigma attached to being blind. So people could hear, people couldn't hear, were thought to be stupid. They just sit there like, what? I can't hear you. Or they were thought to be possessed by demons because of the unintelligible things coming out of their mouth. They couldn't hear themselves. They thought they were making sense, but they weren't. So somebody who was deaf was seen as either stupid or possessed by demons. So think of this man, this poor man. He probably ostracized, probably done everything he could do to try and find relief and healing, but nothing at all worked until some family members or friends loved him enough to bring him to Jesus. Well, we have at least four important details of this man's healing in verses 33 and 34, if we look at the text there. For the four areas that I saw there, his touch, he touched the man. Think of this man, like the leper in chapter one, or earlier, he, he had never even been touched by people for decades. This man likely had not been touched either. Jesus touched him. Jesus looked toward heaven, Jesus sighed, and then Jesus spoke a powerful word. So those four areas, we'll briefly walk through those. So Jesus took him from the crowd to address him privately. Could be not to make a spectacle, or it could just be because he wanted to look at the man eye to eye and say, you matter to me. You're an individual. I recognize who you are, and I care about you, and I see your faith. I'm going to respond to your faith. And Jesus thrust, or put his fingers, in the man's ears. So in chapter 1, we, man, we read about this man with leprosy, as I mentioned. He hadn't been touched. This man is touched now. He's, his ears are being touched. Now again, he can't, Jesus can't go, hey, I'm going to heal your ears right now, okay? If he says that, all the guy sees is... So then Jesus touches his ears, and, go, and the guy's going, oh, something's going something's gonna to happen here. He's going to do something. And then he takes his fingers out of the guy's ears, spits on his fingers, and touches the guy's tongue. Now, that's another one you kind of wiggle in your seat going, oh, with COVID and personal hygiene, all we know these days, that probably won't go over well here. But in the first century, th this gesture was understood as Jesus saying, I'm going to take my ability to speak and give it to you. I'm going to take my ability to speak and I'm giving it to you. So this man couldn't hear, so that's all he could see was Jesus' demonstrative gestures about what he was doing. That was Jesus' healing touch. So the second mark includes this detail that Jesus looked up to heaven. What do you think that was about? Well, this is God the Eternal Son communicating to this deaf man that he, he was in constant prayerful communication with God the Eternal Father in heaven. Jesus looked up to heaven to show this deaf man that this power that you're being healed from, that's where it's from. That's where it's from. And you can look there too. You can look there too. So we have the touch, we have the look to heaven, and then, and then third, he sighed. So we can understand this as a, sign, uh, uh, as a sigh of grief, as a groan of grief. Not grief that Jesus wanted to rest and do something else. Not grief that he's annoyed with this guy. But grief over the devastation that sin has caused this world. The effect of sin over the whole world has just left us broken, brutalized. This man had been suffering for so long. So Jesus sighed the sigh of compassion because he could feel the weight of this man's suffering. This is a compassionate sigh. And then fourth, he looked up to heaven, he sighed, he commanded, Ephatha, and the man's ears were open. It means be opened. The tongue was released, he spoke plainly. So notice that God's word did God's work here. I talk about that all the time. God's word does God's work. And the phrase, his tongue was released, literally means that the chains that bound the man's tongue were broken. How about that? <laughs> the Lord Jesus speaks, and the chains of this man's tongue are broken. But then what happened? Did he go to a year of speech therapy to try to recover things? No. It says he spoke plainly. He spoke plainly. How miraculous. Imagine watching this happen as he come back out of this private area where Jesus and this man were. Imagine like, hey, what's going on, guys? Jesus, boy, is amazing. I can't believe what he just did for me. He spoke plainly. So the healing was not only immediate, but it was also complete. There's no need for speech therapy for a year. But Jesus responded to this man's faith in such a way that it was immediate and was complete healing for him. All this is accomplished by his word. As I said, God's word does God's work even today. I mean, what about me? How can I hear God's word? 
I'd like to hear that. I'd like to be healed in some way. I've got these emotional scars from my childhood or I've got this relationship baggage from my adulthood. How can I be healed? How can I hear God's word? Underneath the chairs in front of you, there's a black cover on it. <laughs> if you don't have one, take it home and read it. This is God's word that always does God's work, even today. This is a treasure God has given us in the Bible. So, so Mark included these details then of Jesus' touch, and Jesus look to heaven, Jesus' sigh of compassion, and Jesus' powerful word, so that this tells something about what Jesus is like. Mark includes this to, add, to build his case and make us say, who is this, Jesus? Who is this? Well, the Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah anticipated the coming of God's promised deliverer who, who would begin to reverse the curse of sin, would open the eyes, open the ears, restore God's people to himself. Isaiah chapter 35 looks ahead to the coming of God's promised Messiah with these words. It says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. There's even a reference earlier in the first couple of verses of Isaiah 35 that actually talks about it being in the desert up there in Tyre and Sidon, in the deserts of Lebanon. And this is happening. He's here, Mark is saying. This is him. This is the promised deliverer. And it's not just for the Jews. It's also for all who have turned to him in faith. We've seen these things happen already in Mark. So our Lord Jesus really is the promised deliverer. And there's more to come. I encourage you to read ahead. I encourage you to read ahead. So this isn't the first time, and it won't be the last time, that we read of people here. They responded, it says, they were astonished beyond measure. And they might be going, oh, gasping and hands on their cheeks and so on. Or they might just be having their hands in their pockets and their robe going, oh, wow, that's amazing. I, I'm astonished at that. That's really something. But I have work to do. I'm, I'm going to head home. Being astonished beyond measure by God's works does not restore us to a right relationship with him. You can't astonish your way into a right relationship with God. So what does? Well, this is only a, a, a chapter, a part of a chapter in Mark. So the accounts of Jesus healing Gentiles who approached him in faith, this woman with the demon-possessed daughter and this deaf man, tell us that the Lord Jesus will respond to all who seek him in faith regardless of background. So what does that look like? What does that mean for us? Well, you may not have a demon-possessed daughter. But Ephesians chapter 2 says that you were born into the captivity of sin and under the power of Satan. None of us are physically deaf. But God's word says that we were all born spiritually deaf. So Mark's purpose in writing is to proclaim the good news. That, that the Son of God and Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And how would he serve? He would give his life as a ransom for all who turn to him in faith, regardless of their background. So, beloved of God, our, our sure hope for all eternity with God is that the perfectly righteous life, the completely sacrificial death, and the triumphant resurrection of Jesus the Christ is counted as ours when we place our faith in him. Just as for this man, Jesus speaking became his ability to speak. Jesus' life is ours by faith, now and forever. So this afternoon, we get to interact with a bunch of people at the block party. A bunch of our neighbors will be coming down the street around 5 o'clock with their camp chairs and come and sit under the tents and maybe uh, have something to drink and have some, something to eat. Well, they may be primarily coming here for food or for fun or for fellowship. But whether or not they recognize it, they have a greater need. They have a greater need, and that is to be reconciled to God by His grace. And there's one hope, there's one way that God the Father has given, and that is the person of God the Eternal Son, Jesus Christ. And so, beloved of God, may the Lord use us to be a light for Him as we delight to live out our faith in Him together.